Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. I'm working on the locomotive this week, and it's time for pistons. Always an exciting milestone on any build, so let's get into it right now. Step one is to figure out exactly how big these pistons need to be. I know how big they should be, of course, according to the drawing, but I want to measure what I actually achieved on the cylinder bores to make sure we get the clearance just right. Just like on internal combustion, of course, on steam, the piston clearance is extremely important. The pistons get a lot hotter than the cylinders do, so they can expand more than the cylinders do. Thus, if we don't have just the right clearance, the pistons can actually seize up. The very first steam engine I ever built was a little wobbler, and it runs great on air, but if you run it on steam, the piston does in fact seize up after a few minutes because of this exact problem. I'm taking lots of measurements in different places on both cylinders just to make sure that everything is round and there's no taper anywhere and that I know for sure what the actual dimensions that I'm shooting for are. Pistons in this engine are bronze, so I've got a nice piece of 932 bronze that we'll use for this. And unsurprisingly, being round, these pistons are going to be made on the lathe. This is how I set initial stick out on stock. If I haven't shown this recently, I put the parting blade in there as close as I'm comfortable to the chuck and then measure from there. And that ensures that when these parts are done, I have room to part them off. I used to just estimate this, and I got it right often enough to convince myself that I'm pretty good at it, but I got it wrong often enough to screw myself when it came time to finish a part and I didn't have room, and sometimes I even had to start over. So now I've learned the hard way to just measure and to use the parting blade as my baseline. There's a bunch of detritus on the end of this stock from a previous part, so rather than face it all the way down, I'm going to part it off. However, you might notice the parting blade installed currently is not my usual one. What is that contraption? A viewer just sent me this. He made one for himself and one for me. This is a spring-loaded parting blade. There's a flexure here that allows the parting blade to move a little bit during parting. This makes the parting blade automatically adjust itself to the exact right chip load and tool pressure. If the blade is threatening to dig in, rather than seizing up and snapping like a traditional parting blade holder, the blade will just flex a little bit until the load lightens up and then re-engage itself automatically. And this will happen so frequently and so fast while you're parting that you won't even know that it's happening, other than you can kind of hear it squeaking and squawking as it does its thing. It's very, very cool. It works super well. Of course, you got to get that spring tension just right, and he did a whole bunch of testing with different amounts of spring and different materials and thicknesses and so on to get the behavior just right. But if you would like one yourself, I'll link to a video below where he explains this tool in more detail. And amazingly generously, he's also sharing the plans for it if you'd like to build one. So link to all that below. This might seem like a radical new idea in parting, but in fact, it's a very, very old idea. Back at the turn of the century, lathe tools were very frequently spring-loaded like this because similar to modern hobby lathes, the manual lathes with those lantern tool posts that they had at the turn of the century were not very rigid, and the lathes really benefited from spring-loaded parting tools. And in fact, they often spring-loaded a lot of their tools. So it's an old trick that has come back around, and we're all better for it. All right, now we can start turning the pistons down to the correct diameter. Both cylinders came in within a couple of tenths of the same bore, so I'm going to make both pistons in a single setup. That'll save me some time and ensure I get a nice accurate dimension on both. So a couple of moderately heavy passes, and then I'll see where I'm at. I should be really close here. Again, this is very, very important, this dimension, so I'm taking my time, making sure the part isn't getting hot, make sure I'm getting accurate measurements and so on. And then I'll take one very, very light cut, and that should be it. I'm aiming for a one thou clearance, no less. A little bit more is okay, but absolutely no less. Conveniently, with the pistons sticking out of the chuck like this, I can grab one of the cylinders and do a little test fit. In fact, I did this test with both cylinders just to make sure. They should slide on there very easily and spin very easily. With experience, you kind of know what a one to two thou clearance feels like, and that feels really good, so I think we're there. Next up is the piston ring groove. Similar to internal combustion engines, steam engines frequently have piston rings. Not always, but usually. Especially on larger engines, you definitely need rings. A lot of smaller model engines don't bother with rings because it honestly isn't always necessary. In this case, the rings are made of graphited yarn, which is, again, quite a traditional thing for small model engines. And even some full-size steam engines used graphited yarn for piston rings. Most full-size engines, though, and most larger models use cast iron rings. 
However, cast iron rings don't translate very well to this small size. So something like graphite yarn or even O-rings works just fine. After bringing the slot to depth, I then widened it to width. Double check that with a gauge block and we are there. The dimensions on the screw aren't very critical because I'm using soft material for the rings. Time for the bore now, which I'll start with a center drill, and then I'm going to drill this undersize, and then finish with a reamer. I'm going to save myself some time by drilling and reaming both pistons all the way through. So kind of a deep hole, but once again, it will ensure that I get an accurate hole down the center of both pistons, because I'm doing everything all in one setup, and it saves me a bunch of time. If you've ever wondered about speeds and feeds for reamers, a rule of thumb that the old timers often quote is half the speed, twice the feed. Now, of course, diameter and speed don't scale linearly, so that rule of thumb is a little bit fudgy, but it's a pretty good average and it works out pretty well. In general, just run reamers slower and push them in there faster. You don't generally want to peck with a reamer like you do with a drill, unless the hole is really, really deep and the reamer is going to plug up, then you might have to. Break those corners, and now I'm ready to part off the first of the two pistons. I'm going to use my awesome new parting contraption. I love this thing. It works so well that I'm running the lay that double the RPM that I usually do for parting, and I'm feeding pretty much as fast as I want. Like, this thing just chews through. You can hear it compensating for the tool grabbing, and it just powers right through like nothing I've seen before on a small lathe. It's really, really awesome. Definitely going to be my go-to parting blade from now on. Even the finish it leaves behind is super nice. Here's another way to check for correct clearance. The piston should fall through under its own weight, just like that. It hangs up a little bit at the ends because there's some small burrs on those steam ports that I'll clean up, but if it falls through without getting stuck under its own weight, then you've got a one to two thou clearance. This same test, besides being a lot of fun, also works on fire tubes in boilers for silver solder clearance. Also, that's just super fun, so I'm going to do this for a while. I'll see you in a minute. Conveniently then, the other piston is already queued up. It just needs its groove, and then it's ready for parting off. If you've never seen steam engine pistons before, you might be wondering why they're simple flat discs instead of the complicated wrist-pinned skirted contraptions that internal combustion engines have. And that's because steam engines are double acting most of the time. And what that means is that there's steam pressure and thus power strokes happening equally on both sides of the piston. So the piston is just a disc because it has to have the same amount of gas expansion space on both sides of the piston inside the cylinder. It's part of what makes steam engines so efficient is that every stroke is a power stroke. A two-cylinder steam engine has the same number of power strokes as a V8 gasoline engine. That's not to say that steam engines are overall more efficient than internal combustion, the thermal efficiency of reciprocating steam, in particular, is not that great. Turbine steam, on the other hand, is extremely efficient. That's why we still use it in power plants, ships, and lots of other places. But turbine steam does not make cool chooching noises, and is therefore inferior. On to the piston rods now. I've ordered a special piece of material for this. This is precision ground stainless bar stock. It needs to be stainless, of course, because it's going to be in a very high moisture environment inside the cylinders. And being precision ground, it'll make a nice, really nice sliding shaft. When I order ground stock, I always check the dimensions in a few places because it does have a tolerance on it. Unless you buy the really, really expensive stuff, it's usually plus or minus half a thou. So I check and see where it is. And in fact, this piece all the way down the bar is basically dead nuts. So that's super awesome. I can use any piece of it and I know what I'm getting. All I really need to do is finish the ends with a couple of features, which is going to save me a lot of time. I'll say I've also checked these two pieces for straightness, because of course that's very important with piston rods. Start by facing off the end, as is tradition. Now this end gets a thread put on it, and that's going to attach to the crosshead. So I'm going to start by putting a center in it. I kind of figured I would need one because I'm going to have enough stick out here, and this is pretty thin material, so I want a tail support. To turn this down for the thread, I thought I'd try this carbide insert that I use for a lot of different steels. It works pretty well usually. 
but not in this stainless. It was just refusing to cut that at all. The insert is in good condition, but it was just not having it on this stainless. So I brought in one of my trusty high-speed steel tools, and that's doing a really beautiful job. Look at how nice that's cutting. I've ground this tool specially for clearance around a tailstock center. As you see, it's ground to a 55 degree angle on the back. And of course, tailstock center is 60 degrees, so I can always get in right to the end of the part, even if it's quite a small diameter with tail support. In model engineering, we're often working with very thin, long parts. So you've got a tail stock in there, and you're working very close to it, so tool clearance becomes a real issue. That's looking good. I've got that turned down for the thread. Now I want to put a taper to connect the turned down area to the wider area. The drawing calls for a 30 degree included angle on this. So I've got my protractor set to 15, and I'm just kind of eyeballing my compound angle up against the chuck face there. This is an aesthetic detail, it doesn't have to be perfect. Somewhere in the ballpark of 30 degrees included or 15 degrees on one axis will do it. And I'm going to have to have a lot of tool stick out to reach in there around the tailstock once again, but that's okay. We're just doing a light cut, so this amount of tool stick out won't hurt anything. And then I take a couple of passes, feeding this with the compound until I see the taper meet up with the smaller diameter at the bottom. This is a very satisfying cut, I have to say. It's a really nice little detail that I might not have thought to do, so I'm really glad it's in the drawing because it really is a beautiful little touch. It's little details like this that make or break the appearance of a locomotive. Now I can come in and do the threads for the crosshead to attach to. Finally, I'm going to choke up the stock once again because I'm actually going to face down that threaded area a little bit. I left that threaded area long so that I could face it down to the final desired length and thus get rid of the center that I put in the end of that part. At least that's the story I'm telling you. What actually happened is I screwed up the taper because I had my compound set to the wrong angle and then realized I could just turn down the shoulder because the other end of the part isn't finished yet and I have extra length, recut the taper, and then face down the threaded area, and then realized, oh, I've conveniently removed my center. That was a really clever order of operations that I definitely thought of. So I did the second one the same way. And now I'm just going to claim credit for that. Wait, is this microphone on? Oh, crap, I'm recording. All right, fine, busted. This is what Bob Ross would call a happy accident. I was actually just going to live with the center in the end of the part because it doesn't actually matter, but eh, that turned out better by accident. Now I'm going to flip the part around and face it down to final length. Per usual, you clean up the face, take it out, measure it, then you know how much to remove for realsies, put it back in, and face down that amount to get it to final length. The length of this is fairly important, but there is a lot of adjustment in the crosshead there, so, you know, I'm getting it as close as I can, of course, as always, but I'm not super, super worried about missing this dimension by a few thou here or there. So both piston rods have been brought to that point now. Next, they need a little screwdriver slot in the end, and this is what Kozo's design uses for setting the position of the crosshead. You'll see that later. To get this slot centered, I'm bringing the slitting sod down on top of the stock with a feeler gauge so I don't scratch up the part, zero the quill DRO, then bring it up from the bottom, and then whatever the value of the DRO measures there, I move half of that distance up, and now we are centered. It's the same thing that you're doing with centering using the half function on the DRO, but just doing it by hand because I'm using the quill DRO, which doesn't have all those fancy features. One nice easy pass through there, and we've got a lovely little screwdriver slot. Easy peasy, lemon slotty. Lem what? Oh, that doesn't sound good. I really got to stop trying to make up rhyming expressions. Test fitting time now. I want the rods to be a snug fit in the piston so they'll hold themselves in place while I cross drill them for pins. However, those are a little too tight. I can't push them in and I don't want to press them in because I would risk bending the rods doing that. So I'm going to have to massage them a little bit. Often in this kind of situation, just running the original reamer through the hole again by hand is enough. If it isn't, then running through it with an oversized reamer will do the trick. Because the ground rod that I'm using is the exact same size as the reamed hole was nominally, this doesn't quite go in. Sometimes you get away with that, sometimes you don't. Just depends which side of zero on the tolerance your ground stock came out on. I am going to Loctite these in place, but not with permanency in mind. I suspect the heat of the steam in there is going to destroy this Loctite. 
I'm doing this just as a fixturing for the cross drilling to be very, very sure that nothing moves. This cross drilling is going to be a little tricky and I couldn't really think of a good way to hold them in place while I do it. So Loctite seemed like a good option. So I'll get centered up with the trusty Heimer and get ready for kind of a tricky drilling operation. This is a very, very small hole. I'll start by spotting the high point of the curve so the drill doesn't wander off. And then down we can go through with the final drill. Now what makes this tricky is, of course, the piston is bronze, which drills extremely easily, but the rod is stainless, which is very, very difficult to drill, especially with small drills like this. So I'm running the drill quite fast, 2500 RPM through the bronze, and then when I feel it touch the stainless, I slow the drill down to about 2000 RPM. Because stainless, you want to drill a little slower, and I'm increasing my drill pressure through the stainless just to make sure that it doesn't ever rub because stainless will work harden extremely quickly if you let the drill rub at all. The smaller the drill, the easier that happens, and if it work hardens, the game is over. You've probably scrapped the part. But that seemed to go really, really well. I've got a very tiny little hole all the way through. Looking good. For the pins themselves, I also ordered precision ground stock. This is 1 16th. I didn't do anything fancy for manufacture, just rough cut them to length and then filed them to final length and deburred. These pins are going to be completely invisible inside the pistons their entire life, so no need to get fancy with them. As long as they're not longer than the hole that they're sitting in, they will function correctly. Now technically those pins don't need any fixturing at all because of course they're trapped by the rings, but I did actually Loctite those in place just for giggles. And again, the Loctite may not survive the heat, but can't hurt. Time for the rings now. Instead of the traditional graphite yarn, I'm actually using Teflon cord. This is the stuff you buy for gland packing in household faucets. It works really, really well in model steam engines as well. You do a couple of wraps of this stuff and it's very squishy, but then it expands over time to take up space. So you can squish it down into the piston ring groove and then stuff it into the bore and it'll relax once it's in there and make a really nice seal. And being Teflon, it's extremely slippery. Good stuff. Now I thought I'd try and be clever and use a hose clamp as a ring compressor and yeah, this kinda sorta almost worked, but not really and honestly isn't necessary. I thought it would be neat if it worked, but I've made lots of model engines with Teflon cord piston rings and all you really have to do is get the piston started and then get in there with a pokey something and stuff the ring material down into the bore. And then once it's in there, it'll, like I said, correct itself. It'll expand and conform to the bore and life will be good. There we go. Once it's in there, it seems like it's hard to get it in, but once it's in, it moves very, very smoothly again because of that Teflon slipperiness. I'll put some oil in there now. Probably should have done that first, but here we are. That is moving beautifully. Very happy with that. Well, let's do a little test with some air and see what happens. Well, how about that? This is kind of like first signs of life from this engine. We've made a teeny adorable little air hammer. The efficiency of this is basically a function of how good a seal I can make on the other half of the port with my thumb, hence the variation in the speed of the rods, but I'm really happy with that motion though. They seem to be working really well. This is 20 psi, which is more than should be necessary for moving the pistons, but again, because there's no seals or gaskets in anything and I'm trying to cover the port with my thumb, well, you know, 20 psi is working well. This is also fun. I'll see you in a minute. There we are, pistons, rods, and rings for our lovely little steam engine. The pistons are always a fun milestone on any engine build, and this is no exception. I'm really excited to be at this point. Well, I hope you enjoyed the process of seeing steam engine pistons being made and how they're different from internal combustion. Thank you very much for watching, and thanks especially to my patrons who make this content happen every single week, and I will see you next time.